Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for staying until the end. I'm looking forward to having a conversation. One thing you don't know about me is that, in fact, I'm a recovering high school English teacher and school head. So I look forward to talking with and learning from peers. Indeed, the last few days, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to interact more informally with several of you. I uh, was particularly interested in what your Secretary of Education had to say yesterday afternoon. Unfortunately, from my point of view, at the risk of sounding like a cheeky American, I think he left a couple of things out of his presentation. Mainly, what's the problem we're trying to solve? Networks, he mentioned. Technology, he mentioned. Our answers to what question? Solutions to what problem? Put it differently, what does it mean to be an educated adult in the 21st century? What are the biggest challenges you face as practitioners today? I would like to suggest two, and I'll elaborate on them. Number one, in the new global knowledge economy, all students need new skills. The skills for careers, continuous learning, and citizenship have converged. They are the same skills. And they are skills that, for the most part, are neither taught nor tested, even in our very, very best systems around the world. That's problem one. Problem two, this generation, as you well know, is very differently motivated to learn. And many of the traditional carrots and sticks, the traditional incentives for learning that we've relied on for many generations, don't work for this generation. So, to elaborate, how many of you have read or are familiar with the ideas from Thomas Friedman's book, The World is Flat? Raise your hands. I really urge you to take a look at that book. For me, it, it was the most important and influential book that I have read in the last decade. Basically, he describes a world where increasingly any job that can be turned into a routine, white collar, blue collar, manufacturing service, it doesn't matter, is very, very, very rapidly being either offshored or automated, leading me to worry what skills will our young people need to get and keep a good job? And are they the same skills they'll need to be effective learners and citizens? So four years ago, I undertook what was for me a very different kind of research. This was in pre preparation for the book that became The Global Achievement Gap. I started talking to a very wide range of senior executives, literally from Apple to Unilever to the US military, trying to understand what are the skills that matter most to them. I talked to college teachers, asked the same question. I talked to recent graduates and asked them in what ways they felt they had been most and least well prepared by their education. And I came to understand that in addition to what we would call the habits of the heart, and by that I mean qualities of empathy, integrity, moral courage, compassion, in addition to those qualities which have always been and will always be important, indeed they are what define us as human beings, there's a set of new or radically transformed skills that every young person must be well on the way to mastering by the time he or she completes secondary school. I call them the seven survival skills for careers, college, and citizenship. Let me briefly explain them to you and sort of annotate some of the implications along the way. Critical thinking and problem solving over and over again emerged as the, one of the single most important skills in any workplace today. The best employers, profit, nonprofit, big business, small business, it doesn't matter. The best employers expect that every single employee will think continuously about how to improve the product, the process, or the service. Ritz-Carlton, arguably the best hotel chain in the world, gives a $2,000 budget to every single employee. I'm talking barmaid, bellhop, chambermaid, $2,000 each to solve a guest's problem on the spot without any supervisory permission required. In other words, every employee at Ritz-Carlton is a problem solver and has to think critically. But when I started exploring with these executives, what, is it, what do you mean by critical thinking? It got interesting because, you know, for us it's a buzzword. We don't really have to define it because it's not on the test. So you might ask an educator to say, well, critical thinking means thinking critically. It's kind of a circular thing, really, <laughs> or some, something to that effect. But what was interesting to me was how consistently 
all of these people with whom I spoke answered the question as critical thinking is the ability to ask really good questions, to ask the right question. So if you want to talk to Siri, mentioned by Julie Young, you have to know how to ask her the right question. But more fundamentally, you see the contradiction being that too much of education is about memorizing the right answer versus knowing how to ask a really good question. Collaboration across networks and leading by influence emerges as the second skill. Increasingly, all work is done as teamwork around the world these days, but more and more it's being done virtually. It's being done fiber optically. So IBM told me that when they had a new customer need or problem to solve, they would pull together people from their different centers around the world to work on that problem. First prerequisite, obviously, is really deeply understanding and appreciating differences, cultural, religious, ethnic. But the way in which those teams are led, I learned, is radically different than it was just two decades ago. They are led by peers through influence rather than by supervisors with positional authority. Now, little problem. Education is arguably the most isolated profession in modern work life. Most of us work alone all day, every day for most of our careers. How are we who have rarely, if ever, experienced meaningful teamwork in our workplace going to teach that skill to our students? How are we going to model that behavior? And how are we going to ensure that every young person, not just those who lead the co-curricular activities, but every young person learns how to lead peers through influence? Agility and adaptability has emerged increasingly in the fast-paced work environment today as a highly prized set of skills. To be agile and adaptable means to be able to pick up a brand new problem, solve a need, a customer need, on the spot. But contrast that agility and adaptability and that fast pace with the everyday regularity and routine of school, where one day is very much like the next and a very, very far cry from demanding any kind of agility or adaptability. Initiative and entrepreneurialism. It was Mark Chandler, vice president and general counsel at Cisco Systems, who said to me, we lay awake at night worrying about how to keep that entrepreneurial spirit and that sense of initiative alive in these large companies. He said, if I have an employee who sets and meets five goals, 100%, that's simply no longer good enough. He said, if on the other hand, I have an employee who sets and meets 10 stretch goals, taking a risk, and perhaps only succeeds at seven or eight, he or she is a hero, not a failure. But what would that person be in our schools? Well, they would have missed two or three out of 10, right? Would make them a C or a B student, perhaps, at best? More recently, I've been doing research for this new book that'll be out next April called Creating Innovators. I've gone to some of the most innovative companies in the world trying to understand how do you develop a culture of innovation. And one of the things that I've learned that sticks with me the most is how much they prize failure in the process of innovation. IDO, leading design company in the world, has a motto, fail early and fail often. D School at Stanford, one of the most innovative college programs I know, said to me, well, we're actually thinking F is the new A. So maybe instead of A-level exams, we'll have F-level exams here in England, right? But the point is this. Why do they all prize failure? Because they learn more from their mistakes, and the only way you can innovate is through trial and error. Think back to your own lives and your own careers. Have you learned more from your successes or your failures? Raise your hands if you've learned more from your failures than your successes. Let the record show I see almost every hand up. Same for me. Yet, what do we do to our kids in school? We penalize failure. And we make taking risks something that they don't want to do. Effective oral written communication is the number one complaint of both college teachers and employers. But a senior executive at Dell said to me, you know, the reason these kids can't write is they don't know how to think, meaning they don't know how to reason. They don't know how to develop an argument. And he said, that's only half the problem. The other half of the problem is they don't know how to write with voice. Those are his exact words. Meaning they don't know how to put their own passion and their own perspective into their communications so as to be more deeply persuasive. Accessing and analyzing information, well, we all know that. 
The amount of information is growing exponentially, changing constantly, and it's right here. It's on every internet-connected device. Raises, from my point of view, really profound questions. The role of memorization in education. Uh, the question I ask American audiences is, is, how many of you can recite the 50 state capitals while, while I Google them, and let's see who's quicker? I don't know what the uh, great British equivalent would be, but the point being, what is the role of memorization in the 21st century? And will our teachers be ready when the iPad or its equivalent replaces textbooks? Because textbooks are frequently obsolete before the ink is even dry. How, how many of you had to memorize the periodic tables in school? Raise your hands. For elements, right? right? How many are there? Can you tell me? Well, whatever your answer is, it's wrong because four new ones were added last week. Oh, and let's talk about planets. How many are there again? Are we up one or down one? Is Pluto in or out of the club today? I, I haven't checked my news feed yet. Do you see my point, though? It's not just the exponential growth of information. It's changing constantly. It raises profound questions about what should be learned and why. Curiosity and imagination. How many of you have read Dan Pink's book, Whole New Mind? Raise your hands. His idea is that more and more in the 21st century, people want highly specialized consumer products that require more imagination. But I've been thinking very differently for this new book about a different kind of problem. In highly industrialized countries like yours and mine, the driver of the economy has increasingly become consumer spending. 70% of America's economy is based on consumer spending. And up until recently, that spending in your country and mine has been fueled by debt. People borrowing money, spending money they do not have to buy things they may not need, threatening the planet in the process. That really is, I think, one of the origins of the crisis of economies in today's world. So the question I'm asking is, what's going to replace that economy, which I don't think is sustainable, economically, environmentally, or spiritually? What's going to replace it? I think there's a one-word answer. It's innovation. Our countries have to become better at solving more different kinds of problems for more different kinds of people, thereby generating wealth and creating jobs. Our countries have to solve the problem of how to create a sustainable planet. We have to create more young people, many, many, many more young people, who are truly able to innovate, to have jobs that are meaningful, and to create value. And curiosity and imagination are the wellsprings of innovation. You know, a lot of people say, well, America's always been very innovative. You'll always be innovative. Is that because of or in spite of our education system? What do Bill Gates, Edwin Land, the inventor of the Polaroid instant camera, now obsolete, Bonnie Raitt, the famous folk singer, and Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook fame, all four have in common? Anybody know? They all dropped out of Harvard, thank you very much, to pursue their highly successful and innovative careers. So what I've been doing in this new book is trying to understand what must we be doing differently as parents, as teachers especially, as mentors and employers, to develop and to nurture curiosity and imagination as the wellspring of innovation. I'll talk more about that in a moment. But let me just tell you how frequently I've heard the fear expressed by educators, head of one of the most prestigious private schools, meaning independent schools in America, said to me, you know, I worry the longer our kids are in this excellent school, the less curious they become. Kids start out curious. You've probably heard Ken Robinson talk about curiosity being schooled out of us, creativity being schooled out of us. Why? One word, test prep. Increasingly around the globe, I see one curriculum in every school, test prep. Now, I believe in accountability. I believe in assessment. The problem is we are using predominantly multiple choice factual recall tests, the results of which tell us absolutely nothing. I mean nothing about college, career, and citizenship readiness in the 21st century. Those assessments are totally obsolete. 
Now you contrast those with PISA type tests. How many of you know PISA? Program for International Student Assessment? Three quarters of PISA tests are constructed response open-ended questions that demand thinking, not factual recall. They test students' abilities to apply what they've learned to new questions and new problems. How many of you know how well Great Britain does on PISA tests? Raise your hands. Fine, I don't even have to embarrass you. Uh, suffice it to say, I think you do about as well as we do, which is to say miserably, very badly. The point being, good tests are worth teaching to. Bad tests are a waste of everyone's time. What gets tested is all that gets taught, as you well know. And having the wrong metric, I learned from business people, measuring the wrong things is worse than measuring anything at all. We have to, as a profession, advocate for accountability 2.0, which I want to talk about in just a moment. Okay, so that's the first problem. All kids, new skills. Very briefly, the other problem. Generation differently motivated, growing up 24-7, tethered to the Internet. You know, for them, a bad day is a slow Internet connection. And I'm inclined to sympathize greatly with that these days. But it's what they're doing on the web that's so fascinating. For them, it is their primary tool of learning. They use it to connect, to create, to collaborate. I find kids Googling stuff just for fun. I find kids in the back of the room surreptitiously Googling what the teacher is talking about to see if it's still true. <laughs> so they're, multi, they're sort of multitasking in a multimedia world everywhere except in their classrooms. Now, let me be very, very clear. I do not see educa education problems being solved by technology. Technology is not a panacea. I think, in fact, it represents a double-edged challenge. On the one hand, we must use these new technologies that are so powerful for learning in the classroom. I went to Finland, the highest performing education system in the world. Every student had unfiltered access to the Internet in every classroom. They recognized it was a powerful tool for learning, and they would teach kids how to use it responsibly and effectively. I want to see students regularly sharing work through wikis, Google Docs, and things of the sort, learning how to do powerful Internet searches. On the other hand, I also see that this is a generation that does not yet know how to not multitask. Studies in America indicate that the average young person between the ages of 8 and 18 is spending 7 hours and 38 minutes a day on devices after they've finished homework. So we're going to have to teach them, I think, how to not multitask, how to develop the capacity for sustained concentration, which is essential for any kind of serious intellectual or creative work. This generation is also, I'm sure you've observed, less fearful and respectful towards authority. They refuse to listen to authorities who talk down to them or talk at them. But at the same time, this is a generation hungry for mentoring and coaching. And they're demanding a different kind of relationship from the adults in their lives. Finally, this is a generation that is impatient to make a difference in the world. They really want to make a difference more than they want to make money. So it's a generation very differently motivated for both learning and work. So I mentioned to you that I've been doing a research for this new book called Learning to Innovate, interviewing highly, highly innovative 20-somethings in a wide variety of, of arenas, some who've gone to schools like Stanford, MIT, and Harvard, some who are dropouts, trying to understand what, what has enabled them to be innovative. I then go and interview their parents, I then go and interview the teachers whom they've told me have made the greatest difference in their lives. And I make what for me is a stunning and deeply troubling discovery. In every single case, these young innovators described a teacher to me who when I went to interview that teacher, I discovered that he or she is a complete outlier in his or her education setting, teaching in ways that are radically different from his or her peers. But when I saw the pattern, I began to realize that while these outliers were teaching differently from their peers, the what they did collectively and together was stunningly similar. And I've come to understand that this culture of schooling 
is fundamentally at odds with the culture that develops the capacity for innovation in five essential respects. Number one, our learning system is based on celebrating and rewarding individual achievement. Well, the culture of innovation is all about collaboration. It is a total myth that individuals innovate alone. Our learning culture rewards and incents increasing levels of specialization. The whole goal is to become an expert in your field. The world of innovators is all about crossing disciplinary boundaries to solve problems. We risk avoid in our world. We penalize failure, as I've said earlier. Whereas the world of innovation is all about taking risks, all about learning from mistakes. Our classrooms are very often passive consuming experiences. This is where students are socialized to become consumers. It's how they're educated, passively. Whereas the world and the classrooms of innovators is all about creating. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we rely almost exclusively on extrinsic incentives, rewards and punishments for learning. But the learning culture of innovators actively encourages intrinsic motivation. And then when I explored what was that about, I discovered another pattern around play, passion, and purpose. The, most, the parents of the most innovative young people whom I encountered actively encouraged a more exploratory, free-form kinds of play. More time outdoors, more time with toys like sticks and ropes, and less with things that required batteries. And they encouraged the young people to find and pursue a passion. For them, that was more important and a more key aspect of success in adult life, finding and pursuing a passion, than was mere uh, academic achievement. Because they understood, and what I observed with the best teachers is that as you pursue a passion as a young person, say an adolescent, that passion morphs, that passion changes, and it becomes and evolves into a deeper sense of purpose. So I saw the developmental arc go from play to passion to purpose <clears throat> in all of these young people's lives. And the key roles adults played at every single level in developing play, passion, and purpose. I'm going to skip a couple of slides here because I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for the so what, now what questions. When I, I, I spend a lot of time in classes. And one of the things I like to do is go for what I call learning walks, meaning that I want to learn how to look at and talk about instruction because I believe that's the key to the transformations that we're describing. One of the things I have sometimes done is simply spend a day observing in different classes, listening for who's asking what kinds of questions. Are they most always factual recall questions? Guess what's on the teacher's mind? And with what kind of wait time? Is it always, you know, the next question is answered, then we move right on immediately as soon as one hand goes up? So if you want an interesting experience, do a learning walk in your school and listen for who's asking what kinds of questions with what kind of supporting or follow-up questions. What do you mean by that? What's your evidence for that? How would you compare that to this? Deborah Meyer and her colleagues developed what was, for me, the best definition of critical thinking that I've encountered in print. It's not one skill. It is, in fact, a set of skills, the ability to weigh evidence, to understand perspective, to think about connections, to speculate on possibilities, and to really reflect on value, social and personal. But fundamentally, these are habits of question asking that are at the heart, I think, of learning these skills that we've just been discussing. Now, let me be clear. This is not a question of skills versus content. You don't teach these skills without engaging students in rich and challenging academic content. And yes, I believe there's such a thing as cultural literacy. So three years ago, when the Russians invaded Georgia, I, I was concerned that a lot of students in America thought South Carolina might be next. <laughs> it's a true story. So cultural literacy matters. Learning content matters, but we're going to have to radically reduce the amount of content taught in schools and assessed in order to make the time and the space for the mastery of the skills that matter most in the 21st century. In the 21st century, 
employers and others do not care what you know. Knowledge is a commodity. It's free. It's like air and water. What they care about is what you can do with what you know. And that's what we have to teach our students. It's a profound shift. It is not about education reform, your secretary's preferred term. It's about education reinvention, which is an entirely different problem. Okay, three starting points for reinvention. I believe everybody talks about data. Not enough people talk about evidence. Einstein once said, that which can be measured doesn't always count. And that which counts can't always be measured. Ask an employer, any employer, um, how much they rely on standardized test scores to hire or promote employees. The answer will be none, none, zero. What do they do? They rely on human judgment. And if it's good enough for business, it's got to become good enough for education. But we've got to be much sharp, sharper about the questions we ask ourselves and each other if it's going to be about human judgment. We have to ask ourselves, what skills are we teaching? And how are we assessing them? We have to ask ourselves, what's the school doing to systematically improve instruction? How do you know it's working? Are your teachers better now than they were two years ago? How do you know? What's the evidence? Not the test score, not the, just the data, the evidence. How well are your students prepared for college careers and citizenship? How do you know? Is your school really adding value? In many schools, kids come in smart, they leave smart. What's the value added? So three areas for work here in conclusion. Accountability. We have to hold ourselves accountable for what matters most. And it's attainment and engagement versus test scores. Oh, and by the way, when we do attainment and engagement, when we take those very, very seriously, test scores actually improve by not teaching to the test, by instead teaching kids to use their minds well and to be actively engaged in their learning. Test scores actually go up by not teaching to the test. That's clear evidence for that. We have to really carefully observe what is our cohort graduation and how well do students lead, what do, do, how well do they do once they're in college and what's the college completion rate? Do you all know in, in Great Britain? Here's a little friendly question for you. Has your post-secondary completion rate gone up, stayed down, gone down, or stayed the same in the last decade? Anybody know? Yes? It's gone down. You were ranked third among OECD countries in post-secondary completion in the year 2000. The latest data I saw suggests that you're now ranked 15th. Now think about what that means for your students and the future of your country. Now, I don't mean to, to in any way embarrass you. Our numbers are worse. The problem I'm trying to point to is what are we holding ourselves accountable for? Scores on tests which tell us nothing about children's or the country's future, or something like attainment, meaning some form of post-secondary degree which is increasingly an entry-level requirement for any job that pays more than minimum wage. There are very good assessments out there. I write about them in the Global Achievement Gap. This is one of them, the College and Work Readiness Assessment, an online test of analytic reasoning, critical thinking, problem solving, and writing. Schools today can and do use it as an auditing tool to see to what extent their students are really college and work ready. We also need qualitative data, data for the heart, videotape focus groups with your recent graduates. I don't care what age they are. Ask them in what ways they felt most and least well prepared. What is their advice for teachers? What is their advice for students? And videotape those focus groups and bring them back and play them to your teachers and to your parents. There's an example on my website if you want to see one. Finally, I think every single student needs a, an adult advocate who knows that student well. One of the overlooked reasons for Finland's extraordinary success is that kids work with the same teachers for two or three or four years, even up through upper secondary. Academics, obviously, you have to do the new work of teaching and testing the skills that mass, matter most. We've got to start, I think, by working on what I call the three C's, critical and creative thinking, collaboration, and communication skills, ensuring that those are taught every day in every class, at every single grade level. I also think we need to increasingly pilot interdisciplinary courses organized around questions, like what is global warming and is it a problem, and if so, what should we do about it, that kind of a course, as well as capstone projects at the end of secondary, 
and primary, where students have to demonstrate mastery, show what they know. I was just talking to a gentleman earlier today who has this idea of starting a laboratory school, a startup to really show how this work can be done. I think that's exactly right. We need that kind of research and development capability in education if we're to transform it. Finally, I think every student should have a digital portfolio that follows the student from first grade, that is owned by the student. So when I get a new student in a new school, I can peruse the work he or she has done, know exactly where that person is and where they need to go. It's actually a two-for-one. Not only do I have a better sense of that student, but that student has much more pride and sense of mastery in his or her work knowing that it's for a real audience. It's going into his her, or her best of portfolio. Finally, I think we're going to have to do the new work in new ways. Isolation is the enemy of improvement. Isolation is the enemy of innovation. We have to ensure that all teachers are on teams for collaborative inquiry, looking at both student work and teacher work as on a regular basis. That's the only way teaching improves, is through that kind of collaborative peer inquiry. I believe videotaping of lessons is one of the most powerful and underutilized technologies in schools. Ultimately, I want to see the basis for promotion and retention of teachers be according to a peer-reviewed digital portfolio of the teacher's best work. Units of planned samples of student work, interviews with students and focus groups about how they were engaged, and so on. Folks, um, I've gone on a minute or two too long, but we're going to have time for informal Q&A afterwards, as our friendly moderator will tell us. But I did want to let you know about a couple of resources. People have wanted to know where they can buy the Finland phenomenon, the video that was shown last night. The information is here. That's the book I've been referencing. Uh, that's an earlier one, and this is my website for staying in touch. Let me conclude with a quote from literature, as I must, being the recovering high school English teacher that I am. You'll no doubt recall the opening lines to Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. These are incredibly challenging times in education, and you know that better than I. It's a hard time in history to be an educator. But I also know, in some ironic ways, it is the best of times. Because I have the rare privilege of being able to go around the world and meet extraordinary educators like yourselves who are deeply committed, who are courageous, and who are working to transform, not merely tweak, but transform teaching and learning for the 21st century. So I simply want to end by thanking you for the incredibly important work you do every day. Thank you.